um, with me today, uh, I have four excellent panelists who I'll introduce you to in a minute. Um, this webinar follows on from a vlog that the, the five of us did actually recently, following on from the publication of a book called Living Together, Separating, Divorcing During a Pandemic, um, which uh, the four panelists today were involved in contributing to. It's an excellent book. And if you want to know more about it, then do have a look at the vlog on the Family Law Blogger where we discuss um, specifically discuss that book. But one of the things that came out of that discussion was um, a theme of transitions. And so the, the five of us thought it would be really interesting to think about that in the context of um, transitions for families, particularly in light of the pandemic and particularly for, for children. So uh, the panellists today, I'll just introduce you to them briefly and then we'll move to the discussion. So first of all, we've got Sue, Sue Atkins, who's going to talk to us about school transitions, particularly during the pandemic. Sue is an internationally recognised parenting expert for BBC ITV, Disney Family uh, for this morning, and she's also author of the best-selling book Parenting Made Easy, How to Raise Happy Children. And Sue has recently written a new primary to secondary programme uh, to support families and, and schools during this milestone, so we're really looking forward to hearing about that from Sue. Then Louisa, Louisa Whitney, morning Louisa. Uh, Louise is going to talk about parenting transitions, so parenting transitions from one home to two. Uh, so Louisa is an accredited and child inclusive family mediator, PPC and trainer, and she runs her own mediation practice online and in Surrey. And then Jane, Jane Cooksey is going to talk to us about creating new parenting relationships. So Jane has studied and practiced psychology and law and is a professional family mediator with the FMC. And Jane's currently doing all her work on Zoom, so she'll be very familiar with all of this. And she normally operates out of central London and the South East. And then finally, my partner at Milton Reeve, Alison, Alison Ball. Alison's going to talk to us about different communication styles in times of transition. Alison heads the Manchester family team at Milton Reeve, and she also leads our domestic and international mediation practice. She's an accredited family and commercial mediator and collaborative lawyer and assist separating couples and their children with family disputes of all kinds. So that's our excellent panel. Um, so our panelists are gonna focus, take, take four kind of themes of transition in turn. Um, I think it's fair to say that we're living through times of unprecedented change, both for individuals, for families and for governments. And it seemed to us that there were some parallels that could be drawn between the need to adapt to the difficulties of the pandemic and adjustments that are needed when relationships end, when our children move on with their lives, for example, primary school to secondary school, or on to university, as one of my children is doing at the moment. And uh, that's something that's been particularly difficult. It's always quite difficult times of transition, but be particularly difficult for young people this year. And in light of that, particularly, we were thinking about communication and how to communicate effectively which seems to be a challenge for us all as individuals, as governments, uh, and uh, in various different contexts. So, without further ado, and with a reminder to ask us questions on the chat, on the uh, Q&A function, I'm going to come first to Sue, if I may. So, Sue, parents across the world this morning are gearing up their children to go back to school <coughs> uh, in this strange new world of face masks, no face masks, you know, in all day, working from home, doing Zoom meetings, Zoom teaching. Uh, so just to think a bit about our first sort of transition theme, which was school transitions during a pandemic. Um, and thinking particularly about primary to secondary, what do you think are the biggest challenges for children and their families for this particular type of transition? Uncertainty seems to be a key word that I hear over and over again mm -hmm. uh, with all the people I'm working with, whether it's young children or children going through change of any sort, divorce or going into new schools. Uh, uncertainty is something that nobody particularly likes. Some people really don't like change either. And of course, for the last six months, that's all we've been living with and trying to learn to live with is uncertainty. So I've been writing quite a lot. I've just created a new free ebook about resilience helping children and families sort of bounce back and cope with uncertainty. So I think children going back to school now, some will be very excited. Some will have had a great experience. They'd have loved home learning. They'd have liked all the broader things that they could do, developing their hobbies, spending time with mum and dad, if dad's working from home. 
spending time with you know brothers and sisters others will have had a chaotic experience where they haven't had enough um, homeschooling you know properly they haven't had a computer they've had to share one so these disparities mean that children are returning to school in all sorts of emotional states um, there will be very, very mixed feelings. I was on a, uh, a webinar yesterday at Teenager 17. After all the exam debacle as well with all those results, she feels very uncertain. Um, she's happy now that she's wearing a mask and all that sort of thing. So for parents, I think, getting ready for children to go back to any form of schooling, it's about your attitude, your mindset, your ways of sort of showing your children that you are relaxed and confident about the school. Uh, so that they can take their lead from you. If you're a bag of nerves, if you're very anxious, then of course the children will feel that, pick up on that. So I think it's important to note it that no worry is worthless. So you need to hold the space for children to feel heard, because I think if they feel heard, they feel understood. You can't sort of all the problems out for them, but you can certainly listen to them, reassure them, and then look for ways to empower them. So simply, you know, washing your hands regularly, staying a certain distance from people, um, those very simple things give children a sense of control over at least some aspects of their life when everything else is very uncertain. And I think the important thing here is for parents to listen more than they talk. I think we've got two ears and one mouth for a reason. And so I think the key to healing through this time of change and transition is to um, you know help people adapt to adjust to bounce back is listening and sharing and being part of the journey with them together um, and i think that will be the sort of the key to healing and don't second guess what your child is feeling no matter how old they are um, don't presume just hold the space for them to feel heard so, I hope so there's that quite a lot about listening in there and there's also yeah. quite a lot from what you're saying about the sort of the parents themselves being really positive so yeah. from what we hear from clients and, and friends and colleagues there's a lot of concerns you know the parents themselves are concerned about what school will look like for the child but I think what you're saying is there's quite a lot in there about acknowledging your own concerns as an adult but also trying to stay positive for the child because the child may have a slightly different view is that is that yeah fair? And I think go online or talk to the teacher because, of course, be patient. I think patience, kindness and respect are key energies for everybody. Because schools, you know, some schools haven't shut. I've got loads of friends who are teachers. I'm a former deputy head for 20 odd years. So I know that people haven't just been sort of lying in the sunshine all through this period. In fact, it's been very, very stressful for people. So remember that teachers themselves, are, you know, my friends had COVID. Uh, they have elderly relatives, they have children they've tried to homeschool. So patience, kindness and respect as we all go through this. Uh, but keep communication going. You know, it builds bridges. It doesn't build walls between the home and the school. And this will soon become the new normal. You know, children are incredibly resilient. But as I say, I do think parents have a role to play in how they hold that stable environment for a child to at least feel they've got a safe haven when they come home. What about practicalities? I mean, you know, the, the, uh, I remember my mum sending me to bed early for the three or four nights before you went back to school so that you were back in a routine. I mean, is that sort of thing actually, is that, you know, ancient history or is that the sort of thing that actually is, really, is helpful in terms of oh, getting yes. the child prepared? Yes, I'm just writing every day. I'm releasing back to school tips on my blog. Uh, practical tips. I'm very practical. There's about eight of them. So one a day, or you can go and have a look at them now. I've been putting them up regularly each day. Very practical things like, you know, plenty of sleep. Make sure you pack the backpack and the rucksack and it's at the front door. The shoes are ready. Things are prepared the night before, like the packed lunch, just to cut down on all the sort of frenetic activity in the morning that can make a child feel very anxious if they can't find their shoes and they don't know what's happening at school. That, that all kind of escalates. So the more you can do to keep things calm, the more you can put in some simple routines. Routines sort of keep us on the track of feeling grounded, which I think is quite important at this time. Absolutely. And presumably for those parents who are separated or co-parenting but in separate households mm -hmm. uh, with children who are going through one of these transitions, it's going to be even more important that they communicate a, a, about that as well so that there's some sort of acknowledgement of how each household is doing it 
I think it's very, very important. I work with a lot of parents going through divorce. I have a whole set of conversational cards for co-parenting. But this is time to park up your differences and put the children at the centre of this process because this is, and I hate this word really, unprecedented times. But they're very challenging. They're very different. The word different is quite helpful because it's less stressful. But if parents can park up their differences about their relationship and put the photograph of their child at the centre of the table when they're talking about school routines or going back to school or any form of change, then I think it really hones the focus on what's best for the child. And you know your child better than anyone else. And you know their personality, that you know what worries them or whether they're a bit blasé or whatever they like their character. So you can work with the parent, the other parent, if you can, to make sure that this transition back to school is as positive as possible. And then soon that all becomes our kind of new normal and we learn to ride the choppy waters of change, don't we? That's great. Thanks, Sue. And actually, that leads us beautifully into um, our next theme, which I'm going to talk to Louisa, discuss with Louisa. Um, which is about a different type of transition, but we sort of touched on it slightly there, which is a transition from one home to two. So, Louisa, what do you think are the key issues uh, in that context, moving from one home to two, whether it's in normal circumstances, as it, whatever normal is, or unpre these unprecedented circumstances? What do you think the key issues are? Okay. I I just wanted to say I love what Sue said about patience, kindness and respect. I think those are three uh, values that you can bring to any transition to make it a little easier. Um, and certainly I'd bring it to this transition. My take as a family mediator is that sometimes the first thought the parents have when they're moving from one home to two is very much about, OK, well, where will the children be Wednesday? Where will they be at a weekend? And those kind of practical arrangements. And of course, you need to make practical arrangements. But sometimes it can be really helpful to just take a step back and really think about the vision of what you want this life to be like when you are parents across two homes rather than parents on one home. And a question that I think sometimes flummoxes people, but it's one that I use personally in any situation, is how good could it be? Really thinking about what that vision is. And... A lot of clients say to me, well, it's not going to be anywhere near that. But unless you start with that vision and know what you would like to aim for, you're not going to get anywhere near it. And it's things like, how do you want everybody to feel? What do you want the values of this to be? Sometimes people talk about everybody feeling calm and there being real calmness around the children. Sometimes I think people also exclude excitement. And I think actually there can be some excitement about these arrangements. And picking up on tiny threads that you might get excited about can be a really good way of starting to put in the building blocks of what that life's going to look like. So it might be things like, um, you know, if, if you are, if you've got one parent moving into a separate home, what's the children's bedrooms going to look like? Are they going to have that different bed that they always wanted to have? You know, that mid-sleeper bed that their friend has that they really want. Those can be things they get excited about. Maybe as a parent, there's a hobby that you've always wanted to take up and you've never had the time to do it or you've never had permission to do it, either from yourself or from the other partner. Maybe part of your post-separation life will be, I'm going to take up this hobby. So it's having things like that that start to build that vision of what you want life to look like. And then when you start to talk about practical arrangements, then you're able to see whether they align with that vision that you've got for yourselves. And you can think, well, you know, if we did this, does that fit in with the vision that we've got? And that gives you the basis. And then if you disagree about some of the practicalities, if you're both agreed on that vision, it can be a really helpful way of looking at things. So that's one of the biggest takes I think I have on this. Just thinking about the overall structure and then the detail will hang off it, but it's kind of your, and to use a collaborative law phrase, it's kind of your anchor statement for, for how you how you um your sort of touchstone about evaluating what the practicalities should look like that's really interesting so how if that was the sort of aim and you're, you're trying to get couples to think about that as they transition from one situation to another um, and also picking up i think on sue's point about keeping the child you know the photograph of the child at the center of all of this as well um, how do you what are your tips to parents for actually trying to make that happen what what would what sort of practical things can people think about if they, if they say I really like to do that. How do I actually start thinking about doing that? I, 
I would say my first tip is that you really have to understand how each other feel. And sometimes people can get a, big bo a bit bogged down in that because they disagree with how each other feel. But my take as a mediator is that the most pointless argument you can ever have with somebody is debating whether they're right to feel the way they feel. Now, we all just feel the way that we feel and it might be irrational, but it's based on our life experiences. So if you can have those conversations and just acknowledge how each other feel, your private judgment's not going to be helpful. Just acknowledge how you feel. And if you understand what each other's worries are, then that helps you to build arrangements that address those worries and to talk about what do you need from each other? What reassurances do you need that the problems you see are going to be okay? So I think that's the most important thing. But I would also say, don't get hung up on the idea that you've got to have the perfect arrangement to start off with. It's very much a trial and error and have conversations with your children in a sensitive way about what are they worried about? What are they excited about? And children can often give great perspectives on things because parents get hung up on which day of the week it is. But parents are, oh, you know, children often think, well, if I haven't got my hairbrush, how am I going to make sure I've brushed my hair before I go to school? Or what happens if someone forgets my pat lunch? Those are the things kids worried about, not whether Wednesday's Mum's Day or Dad's Day. And are there common themes about when parents get stuck or polarised? I mean, from your experience, are there, are there sort of particular particular themes or particular situations where people tend to get particularly stuck? Or is it this point about not having this overarching idea of what they're aiming for? I think that's part of it. I think also there sometimes where parents get stuck is that one parent can have, and I always use the word managed rather than controlled, because I think that has negative sort of images, can have, have, more, have done more of the management of the kind of day-to-day -day preparing meals, sorting them out for school. And it can be a real transition to let go of some of that control and let the parent take up the reign, particularly if there's not a lot of trust between the parties and they're worried that the other parent won't pick up the reins and they'll drop them at school on an inset day or you know they won't be on top of when things are happening so that's really an exercise in talking about what do you each need to happen to try and redress that balance a little bit. So there's a transition really for children and practicalities of arrangements and households but there's also a we're talking about transitions of trust as well aren't we really about people who are trying to learn new ways of trusting each other in, in a different situation as well as trying to trust each other on the practicalities they're trying to sort out. Absolutely. And I think one of the hardest things about divorce and separation is that as a parent, you're trying to support your child through something that you're also going through live yourself. It's not like if your child has issues at school or perhaps they're being bullied or they've had an argument with their friend, you have life experience to call on to help them. But you're trying to support your child through something you're only just going through yourself. So you're often you know, at the same point in that healing process or only a tiny bit ahead. So that can be tough too. Absolutely. That's really helpful. Thanks, Louisa. And actually, that's really useful. We'll come to Jane now, because Jane, what we were going to talk about in terms of a, a theme of transition with you was around a new parenting relationship. So um, you touched on what the implications can be for children. And uh, one of the transitionary themes was creating this new parenting relationship about how people parent separately, but still together in a different way. So what do you what do you mean? What do you envisage when you're thinking about this uh, creating a new parenting relationship? What do you think that means? It's a really important thing for any parent to do when they're separating because it gives the opportunity to come together and actually decide how they want to parent in a different way. And uh, it's an improvement on the communication. It helps parents to uh, release the, some of the pressure and angst that they separated so that they can actually come together and construct in a positive way how they want to carry it together when they're apart. Particularly my machine is going to start sending lots of messages. I hope it's not interfering. Um, I think you're okay, Jane, but could I just ask you to lean slightly closer to the microphone because I, I, I just want to make sure everybody can hear exactly what you're saying. So, so yeah. So if that's the creating a new parenting relationship, or well, that's what you're sort of aiming for, how how do you go about having that dialogue with people? Well, usually as a mediator, it would be in a mediation session or part of the sessions that we have in uh, family mediation. But it is something that parents can do on their own, but it's more useful if you have a third party neutral helping you because it's actually constructing something from the start and actually be looking. And I love what Louisa said about helping people to have 
have vision and um, actually look at the values of what they care about for their children and how they might use those values. So you sit down and look at what children need together and what the parents need to do in order to make sure that they're communicating well about what's happening when these transitions happen. So actually just being the parent in partnership for any transition is quite a good thing. And to get into a method and a system of coming together regularly to talk about something is, is uh, actually uh, a brilliant way of helping them to put the children in central focus. Children... So what sort of tips would you give to parents who are thinking about that? Um, what sort of what sort of te practical tips would you would you suggest to people who are trying to sort of move to a different kind of parenting arrangement? Well, they really need to be looking at what their children's needs are and how they can actually help them. And children need things like boundaries and structures and clarity and systems and knowing where they are. You know, Sue mentioned uncertainty. They really need to know what's going on and they need those conversations and they need to have them with both parents. And if the parents are apart, Sometimes they need to know that both parents are going to actively help each other and work together and that they don't get different messages about doing different things at a different time. Um, so it's, it's important that they can have that time together and work things out. And sometimes they might even have their children being with them in the parenting partnership creation at times. It's quite important to do that. Sounds like there's a lot around listening in there and communication again. Yes. So actually, one of the big tips for parents is to try, if you look at the sort of two ears and one mouth, if you can try and listen twice as often as you speak, it's a good way of actually making sure that you actually hear what the other parents are talking about and what their concerns are. Because you need to look at the parents' needs and how each other is struggling and separating so that each party can um, think about what they need, what they need to do um, at the right time. Uh, so and my big tip is, is that um, they need to actually look at things as they know what, when, where, how, what's the best way of doing it, and actually structure in proper time, one-to-one -one with their children, work out when they're going one-to-one, -one, so they talk about the issues with their children. So it's all about communication, listening, and making sure that uh, the children are heard as well and they know what's going on. Great, and actually that, that leads us beautifully into our final theme, which is around communication, which we've heard quite a lot about already. Um, anybody think we planned this? Um, I'm going to come to, to Alison um, finally, to think about communication style, which I think we would all acknowledge is really important in any family at any time, particularly during separation, and particularly during separation and times of transition, such as the pandemic and periods of change. So Alison, what's your experience of separating couples and how they communicate well or how they don't communicate well, particularly at the outset of, of a separation where, or a big period of transition when there's a heck of a lot going on. What's your sense of how that, what works well, what doesn't work well? I, I think obviously it varies a lot from, from couple to couple, of course. Uh, but you know, when, I'm, when I'm working with separating couples, I'm struck very often by how a couple in the room with me think they are having a dialogue, a conversation together and in fact, they're not. They're having two completely separate conversations. Each is having a monologue uh, and they're not able to, to hear or, or listen to the other person's point of view. And so as an outsider looking in, I can hear both of those stories, those monologues. And my part of my job, I suppose, is to help each of them to be able to start to hear each other's monologue and then, then we can start looking at how they find solutions to the issues that they're facing as, as part of their separation. And, you know, I think we've all talked about communication. Listening is an absolutely key element of that, which most of us forget about most of the time. Uh, but, you know, it's, it, it, in today's world, particularly today's virtual world, being able to connect with others through effective communication is the most important skill. And of course, when you connect with people, then they give you their time and attention. They will see the best in you and they'll place weight on what you say to them. They'll focus on your strengths and they'll over, overlook your shortcomings. And uh, actually they'll, they'll try to help you and they'll want to spend time with you. But it's, 
absolutely key. Presumably it will also um, help people do what the point that Louisa was describing, which is to just acknowledge that, that people may have two very, very different feelings about a scenario, but that they are those people's feelings and that the idea of just trying to challenge somebody's feelings when you shouldn't be feeling that way is, is fairly pointless because if people have truly heard what the other person is feeling and that that's their, their lived experience, well then it can perhaps move past that, otherwise you end up in a sort of circular conversation all the time, don't you, with people just trying to challenge each other's feelings and how or why they should be feeling that way. Yeah, well, I think listening actually does mean not only hearing the words that are spoken, but trying to understand the underlying emotion, the feelings that are underneath them. And quite yeah. often the feelings are very different to the words that are expressed. So you might hear very angry words spoken, but actually what is being said is, I'm devastated, I'm really, really upset. And to try, it's quite hard to do that, obviously, particularly if you're in a, in a state of stress yourself. But as, I think that's why, you know, as mediators, we're able to try and help people to listen to those aspects of the conversation as well. So what um, tips or tools have you found useful? Can we, we suggest to people that they think about using in this time when we, we're all agreeing on communication and, and trying to listen and understand the other person's point of view is particularly important. Indeed, the child's point of view, not just the adult's point of view. Yeah, absolutely. And everybody. Um, so I just want to introduce everyone to a tool that can be used to, to help improve communication. Um, it's a colour based universal language called IMA. I, I think some of those attending today will be familiar with it at, at least and it, the IMA stands for identify, modify and adapt. So perhaps if I just could go on and talk a little bit about, about that. So if you, if you were to imagine that you were going to a networking event or you're going to a meeting of parents perhaps at your child's school or to one of their activities, a football club, whatever it is, or perhaps presenting a webinar even. Now, do you relish the thought of meeting new people, entertaining them with your views and ideas? Will you be happy to speak to lots of different people? And if, if so, you're probably what I would call a high yellow. And there were two high yellows on the panel today, and I'll leave those ones. Yes, you can put in the quick Q&A who you think they might be. Um, Their body language is giving that away already. Yeah, Sue and I are giggling. I think we're just giving it away. Spoke. <laughs> yes. Um, okay, well, does, does that sort of prospect fill you with dread? Are you more reserved? Um, maybe you like your own space? You'd rather perhaps research something yourself, read a detailed brochure than chat to somebody about it. And if so, you're probably a high green. And sadly, we don't have a high green on the panel today. Unless actually, I think the person who's supporting us with the tech might be a high green, I don't know. I'll have to ask her later. Um, would you be happy to go to, a, to an event like that or to take part in a webinar because you love people, you really enjoy listening to others, um, you don't want to upset anyone, if possible, and you want to help. You also don't want to be upset yourself. You might perhaps rather be with your family or close friends at home. Um, you're lovely people. And if so, you're probably a high blue. And we have two high blues with us today as well. So I'll let you guess who they are. We're slightly running out of people. So, um, yeah, or... Um, Perhaps you're not actually that comfortable in a room of people, but you're willing to go to these events because you can see the purpose of them. You know there's an aim that needs to be achieved. Um, you'll start conversations and you'll put your point across quite strongly. And if so, you're probably a high red. And so we have one of those here today also. <laughs> so um, so those, those are the, the four different communication styles. So they're based on whether a person is open or self-contained and assertive or non-assertive. So someone who's open and assertive will be a high yellow and someone who is open and non-assertive will be a high blue. They're both right brain thinkers with a focus on relationship, on people. Someone who's self-contained and assertive will be a high red and someone who is self-contained and non-assertive will be a high gray, a green. And both are left brain thinkers with, a, with more of a focus on facts and logic. And so the, the idea of this universal language is that when we meet someone who's on the same wavelength, you know, we will connect with them uh, immediately. They're the same color as us, we get them. And I think we can all think of somebody who we have done that with. 
Uh, when we meet someone who is the complete opposite, then we may recognize and admire that difference. You know, they say opposites um, attract. But that connection is based on one of difference. So quite often we have to work really hard to overcome that. And that's particularly difficult in challenging times. And when, we, when we're stressed, we retreat into our own comfort zone. We become even more ourselves and communicate even more uh, in that way. And that, in, that, in a change scenario, one where we're particularly stressed, that's likely to cause a lot more conflict with those who are, who are other colours. So how do you use Ima? How do you use the colours? So, so you can, um, I'll ask you in a second why you can find out what colour you are, but how do you use it? How have you used it in your professional practice or personal practice? But what I really like about Ima, and there are, there are lots of other similar things, and there are a lot more sort of detailed psychometric tests you can do, of course, as well, but it's really simple and easy to use. It's really quick. It's only 10 questions to answer and you get the colour. It makes sense. And you can use it in all sorts of settings. You know, obviously, I use it in my work with, with clients in mediation, with clients who I'm giving legal advice to in a collaborative process, within our team at work, within the firm, uh, with my family. It's helped me to understand my kids a little bit better. Um, <laughs> but it is a tool because it's only 10 questions. You answer one differently, you might come up with a different result. So you'll have some people who are very high read. I can think of one in particular who um, is a global world leader and perhaps is not someone to aspire to being like. Um, but, um, you know, the, lots of us will be a bit of a mixture and we can function in all of those different colours most of the time. It's just that when we're under stress, we tend to retreat into our comfort zone and that's when communication can become particularly difficult, you know, in times of stress and change and transition. So it is a tool. And I, I would just, there's a, a word of caution that I would say, it shouldn't be used as a straitjacket. So if you feel you're a high blue, don't feel you can't be anything else. Of course you can. Um, and it also shouldn't be used as an excuse for bad behaviour. So I shouldn't send really short, snappy emails and go, it's okay, I'm a high red, people will understand. You know, that's, that's not really the right way to be if you can help it. I, I agree. I find it very useful, both in terms of team and personal. I've also used it in different contexts. And um, I think it's just quite useful shortcuts. Sometimes when you're, uh, particularly, as you say, under times of stress, when you're trying to talk to colleagues or to clients, or to, it just gives you a sort of shortcut in your mind around why a communication method that you're using isn't, isn't working very well. And, and it's because, oh, hang on a minute, that's because I'm this and this person I think is probably this. So it's just another tool, it's another idea, isn't it, that, 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 can, be, that can be a useful, um, useful thing. Um, conscious of time, so we're going to come to questions in a minute, but just one quick question, Alison, how can people find out a bit more about IMA in the questions? So um, you can go, to, go and do the questionnaire. If you go to www.mills-reed-ima.com, and you'll find the questionnaire there. Ten questions, it's really quick. Um, you can also find it on our website, divorce.co.uk, if you go to the section about um, avoiding court, it's there. Or, you know, by all means, drop me an email. Um, there's also a really helpful document that explains a bit more about the different colours. So if, uh, if you'd like that, then you know, email me and I'll send it to you. Great, thank you. So I think we're going to come to questions uh, now. Um, uh, please do ask some questions using the, the Q&A function. We'll get to as many as, as we can. Um, first hilarious question, which I'm not going to say who it's come from, but has obviously come from a high, level, high yellow. Does the panel agree that the disabling of the chat facility on this Zoom call is very frustrating for high yellows? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, that is what a high yellow is all about. And I can say that because I am one. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm to that opening question. Brilliant. Excellent. Interesting. Um, so more, uh, it's a serious right word, but you know, another question um, that's come in, which is quite interesting, is um, the question is as follows. Matthew Sayed recently wrote that it was time we stopped molly coddling our children and we need to change the negative tone around the pandemic as they return to school. Uh, the questioner says, one commentator they saw said their young children had asked why their life was ruined, having heard that on the news about the virus, economy, exams, etc. Uh, is Matthew Syed right? And how do parents strike the right balance? Good question. Um, I think we'll come to Sue first, but I'm sure we've all got views on that one. Sue, Sue what, do you, what do you think about that? Well, it's a balance, isn't it? Um, these are dangerous times if you're not 
you know, taking care of yourself properly. Uh, I think you have to monitor what you watch, what you read and try and work out what sits with you rightly. I mean, I'm the same. I read sort of, I don't read copiously now because I was finding it a bit depressing and also a bit making me anxious. I, I deliberately turn off, say, Sky News that's on a loop because all they're doing, of course, is repeating stuff every hour. And of course, if you're sitting there listening to it all, your unconscious is just picking up the negative because they don't often have some great stories on there. Um, so you have to be mindful of what you read, how much you soak in. But also then you've got to guide the balance between staying careful, being careful, but also then reacting positively to circumstances. I'm, I'm naturally a half full type of person myself I always look to reframe situations into something more positive now that's not being Pollyanna and happy clappy or being naive but it generally speaking having an attitude of gratitude for example to what you're grateful for what's going well in your day actually focuses you on feeling better and feeling more relaxed about life so you know some days I wake up and think oh my goodness this is a, an awful situation that we're finding ourselves in what can I do today that helps me feel good helps me relax and helps me stay in the moment so I think it's important that we model sort of positivity for our children too and, and holding that sense of balance and if your child is uncertain and feeling scared anxious and worried then just holding the space for them to feel heard and then modeling something that's a little more positive can actually help them. Absolutely. I think it's also perhaps um, drawing on other scenarios. So there's also always been, there's always awful things going on in the world from that children see on the television or hear about, depending on their age group, et cetera, from world wars to, you know, wars to famines to terrible uh, man made or other disasters and how parents manage the, the messaging around that with their children. I, um, I wonder whether that could be a useful resource to, to call upon or be... Yeah, and I think watching social... Being system. careful of their social media activity is important because as they get older, they're picking up stuff from each other. They're, you know, they're, they're you know, fanning the flames of anxiety sometimes. And sometimes young people and kids get the wrong end of the stick. So you need to have those conversations where you can then, you know, guide them back, not sledgehammer them, but guide them back perhaps to a, a more positive mindset. Jane, what do you think about that question? Jane, you're on mute. I agree entirely with what Sue just said, particularly that there's an awful lot of misinformation on social media. And we need to be very careful with our kids and monitor what they're watching and make sure we give them the correct information. But I think to answer this question, I think all children of any age really need to be sat down with the, the, the decisions that need to be made about the risk factors in coronavirus need to be discussed in some of the statistics. Because if you look at it statistically, children are not so much at risk. And it shouldn't be something that destroys their lives or interferes too much with them doing things that they normally do. I think it's about having that listening, hearing them and giving them good, clear information so they have clarity. And what's more, they'll go out as, as models to other children to give them the information they need and not have the misinformation carried around from kid to kid that happens at the moment. So thank you. And clarity. So another question that we have, which is a really important question that, that one attendee has raised, um, has said that this attendee has said they're currently going through a divorce themselves and that they have been cohabiting throughout lockdown uh, with the children uh, and the, with the partner, I think, and also the children are showing signs of increased stress and anxiety. How can the attendee help the children who are 11 and nine? Louisa, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I do. And I, I think this is a situation that a number of people have found themselves in being in lockdown with a partner that they've recently separated from or the decision to separate has come during lockdown. And it's a hugely difficult scenario because you're trying to support your children as a parent, but you may also be finding things very difficult yourself because all of this is new to you. And I think the approach of how my children can be supported through this is absolutely the right one. My first port of call is always to speak to their schools. Firstly, because it's another adult who's around children who can keep an eye on them at school, notice any changes in behaviour, anything that you know, they might be concerned about as being a little bit out of character. 
Secondly, schools also often have a lot of support in place, whether that's through SENCO or whether it's an ELSA, a um, teaching assistant who supports children with emotional issues, or they may have other services such as school counsellors that they can access. And often for children, when they've been in these situations and it has been stressful, it can be really helpful just to be able to offload to another adult who's there for them and can listen as a neutral party Children love their parents, they don't want to say things that might hurt them, but sometimes there's stuff that they just need to offload that happened that they felt really strongly about. Yes, and often children can be a bit different at school to how they can be at home, to how they are in, in different households as well, depending on, on how, what support they feel they need. So I, I agree with you. I think schools, particularly with all the school listeners and school councillors and things that a lot of schools, schools have, could be a really good um, um, starting point really of, of resource to, to try and work out exactly what's going on for the child and also to make sure there's a range of people listening to them perhaps to, 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 to think about that. Alison what do you think about that question? What thoughts do you have on that one? But I'd just say first of all you know what a tough situation for mm -hmm. being really 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 hard and I guess it must be very worried about the children as well if they're showing signs of increased stress and anxiety which is no surprise, I imagine you and, and your, your ex are feeling similarly. Um, it's pretty hard to answer that question on a, on a call like this because I'm sure it's multi-layered, multi-faceted situation. Um, however, I, I think if, if you haven't already done this, which I expect you probably have, but actually to ask your children um, how things are with them and if possible to talk with them with the other parent together and say, you know, we've noticed that you know, things are, you, you're obviously feeling really quite worried about things and we'd really like you to be able to talk with us about it. Um, if that isn't possible, if you're just not able to sit down with, with the other parent and do that together, then um, trying to find some external help to, to help with the scenario, whether it be from you know, a family therapist or a mediator, um, I, I would suggest is something worth considering because these are tough times and it's uh, getting help from, from those who are dealing with this sort of thing day in day out can be hugely valuable. Absolutely. Um, Sue, we'll come to you on that one. Yes, I have a divorce journal for children um, designed and written to help children express and sort of process their own strong emotions it's a positive thing it starts off about families what's good what's different what's not so great so children have a safe place to maybe work through it with their parents with their mom or their dad or they can do it on their own but it's a sort of because this is a very pressure cooker kind of environment and it must be so stressful and difficult so i'd also say look after your yourself as well make sure you get some me time mums are really great at linchpinning holding up the family but actually that stress can really wear you down and, and if you don't quite know where you're going next or how long it's going to take it can be really really stressful for you so make sure you are doing some very simple things to nurture your own self esteem and your own sense of well-being, you know, whether that's a bath with scented candles or a, a daily run or something, because then you come back more resilient, more patient, more rejuvenated to handle the, the, the real challenges, real challenges if you're locked in or locked down with someone that you are trying to separate from. It must be very challenging. But there are things you can do. And also I would suggest when I'm working with parents and families on this to look to the bigger picture. Imagine where you're going. Picture where you're going to be living, how it's going to be, you know, in the next maybe year or so, because that gives you hope. It gives you a destination to be working towards. Thank you. Thank you very much, panel. I think we're going to move, move on to the next questions because we've got quite a few questions to get through. But I'd like to thank in particular the person who asked that question. Um, very important issues raised. Thank you. Um, a broader question here, which is a, a really interesting one that's been sent in. Uh, we focus, the question is, we focus so much on the needs of young children, which we have talked about quite a lot today, but what tools do the panel recommend to help adult children deal with their parent separation and for us to help our clients, our clients deal with their adult children? Um, who would like to take that one? Jane, I think, had, had her hand up. Jane? I, I think this is a, a very important thing because the older children uh, need their parents to be there for them as they're going through puberty or into uh, teenagers and into adulthood. 
they need more contact almost. So it's about, for me, these parents need to make sure that they do have one-to-one -one time with the child, where they actually sit down with them, and it's quite a good idea to take them out for supper or tea or do something, where that discussion can be had about what's going on for them and where they want to go and what the goals are and what the positive things. So I endorse a lot of what was just said by the other people just now, I'd say context, but it really is the parent to spend the time parenting with the child and push aside the other things because that ultimately that's more important having time with their parents and talk about the big issues, the big topics, make a list of them and get through them. I think one of the things I'll come to you in a second, Louisa, I've seen from clients who've um, talked about having adults, so clients who have adult children, they sort of assume that then they can just cope with it because they're adults, so they can cope with their parent separation. Mm -hmm. And I've certainly had to have, have had conversations with clients, whether it's in mediation or other contexts, around remembering that they are still the parents and these 22, 23, 24, 25, 35 year old adults are still the children. And so some of the some of the sort of thoughts and processes that they're going through are not dissimilar to what they would be if they were under 18. And some of the sort of ground rules around trying not to involve your children in the, in the breakdown or the reasons for the breakdown of the relationship are probably still sort of themes to hold in mind. They don't just suddenly get over the fact that their parents are separated the day they reach 18. But Louisa, what did you have to, to add to this question? I think it's a great question because I think teenagers get such bad press for this whole they're surly they're moody and I've seen quite a lot of certainly separating couples in mediation often attribute behavior and surliness withdrawn not talking to their parents as just being general teenage them and of course there are specific things to the teenage age in terms of brains and brain functioning and that kind of puberty aspect but I really would invite parents not to just go they're being a teenager there can be a lot of stuff going on they can feel that it's really hard to share things and also being a teenager now is hard you have all of this going on there's social media there's such a pressure to conform and i think a lot of teenagers feel deeply frightened about making mistakes in things and about people seeing that um, and so i think it can be a lot of pressures and your parents separating can be one more pressure so i would say definitely talk to your teenagers look at what support might be available for them in school there's also the voices in the middle charity which is primarily aimed at age 13 to 19 year olds at the moment which provides support for young people whose parents are separating definitely don't just say it's a moody teen and not think more about that absolutely i think particularly at this this time of the pandemic adults are finding it very difficult to cope with the number of changes and transitions and challenges and so as a teenager who's already going through a load of transitions and changes and challenges it's uh, it, it, it's an extra double whammy and I, I personally as the parent of teenagers are hoping that the the branding of that generation of snowflakes will now go after the window given the uh, the challenges that many of them faced over the last uh, you know six nine ten, twelve months um Alison what did you have on that one what did you want to add to that one um, I just I just thought in relation to adult children, so not your teenagers, that maybe maybe adults who are in their twenties or older, as as you suggested, Caitlin, um, it it is possible for them to be involved in the mediation if that's appropriate to have a voice. Now, um, you know, the 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 Family Mediation Council say that all children who are, who are aged ten or over should have the opportunity to have a voice in in the mediation. And yeah, I think that doesn't stop at 18 or so that there's a there's a lot to be said for having a discussion with a third party present to help adult children as well, no matter how old they are, to adjust because they're particularly if they haven't already started their own families with a with a long term partner, because it can be very scarring, I think, to if it's not resolved. Um, that you know, having a conversation about it with someone who can help with that. Uh, could be very valuable for those adult children in their uh, in their adult lives as they progress through and also uh, another another tool would be to use a family therapist to help with that if they if the adult children are showing particular signs of distress they will often resort to you know um, extreme behavior or um, you know abusive behavior whether it be drugs alcohol whatever and so I think uh, family therapy can be very helpful where you work the fa family therapist works with the whole family 
um, you know, adult children and, and the parents who are, who are separating. I agree and I think this area is yet another area where the law and courts don't necessarily help because once you get to children get to sort of 18 particularly if they're not carrying on in further education uh, the law and the courts tend to sort of say well they're adults and it's sort of not quite irrelevant but broadly irrelevant whereas actually on the emotional and practical side it, it can be the key to help unlock the the way forward for this family to to that better future that we've all talked about in, in various different ways so um, yes, looking to, to the resources such as mediation or family therapy can be a really important um, thing to look at. And I think particularly for the lawyers, not just ignore it, <laughs> not just sort of because the law doesn't think it's that important, not regard it as important for those clients and that family. Um, I, I would have thought there's that, there's that risk as well. Um, just uh, conscious of uh, time, and we've got a couple of quick questions uh, left. Uh, one question, so how do professionals on the panel, great question this, how do the professionals on the panel manage their own feelings and experiences about living and working through a pandemic to be able to most effectively support their clients going through their own difficulties? Perhaps, Alison, I'll, I'll start with you on that one and come to you, Jane. Um, yeah, this is challenging, isn't it? And actually, I think this is true, not just during the pandemic, but generally doing the sort of work that we're doing is it can be very emotionally draining and um, and then it's important really, first of all, to be aware yourself of the impact that you know, a particular case, a particular family is having on you, it's pulling the strings within you. Um, you know, there'll be some childhood experiences there or that, that will impact on how you deal with the situation. And the last thing that any of us want is for that to spill over and affect the service and advice we're giving to our clients. So there are obviously lots of things that we do, but um, particularly within our team, I suppose our case consultation support is one way in which, which um, we can access help with that. Um, so we talk to a, a, um, an independent, actually that is somebody with a therapeutic background to talk over issues in relation to cases. Um, so, but if it's about managing our own personal emotions, then again, it's getting support when you recognise you need it, isn't it? We can't help other people if we're not if we're not looking after ourselves. So same with me, you know, as you said, Sue, making sure that parents look after themselves so that they're able to look after their children when going through periods of transition. It's the same for us, isn't it? So yes, and I suppose uh, mediators, as mediators, we have PPCs. As therapists, we tend to have supervisors. So there's a sort of yeah. professional mechanisms within there, isn't there? As making sure that we all use them. Yeah, and there's a difference isn't there between um, managing your own personal emotions, which is um, not not something that perhaps case consultation may be a bit, but a PPC is there to help you with your professional practice, not to deal with your own emotional angst. Yeah. And I think depending on where you are on that continuum, it's about accessing therapeutic support yourself if you need it. Yes, absolutely. Jane, did you have something to add to that? It's two short things. One is uh, what I call banking or bracketing. So when I, I'm with people, and uh, I have noticing, I'm noticing all the time if I have a reaction, and I bank it, so I've got a vault over here. So I think, oh gosh, something's come up for me, but it's not relevant to this. I'm going to put it in that bank, and then I get it out later, and we have reflective practice and PPCs and everything that Sue was talking about. But the other thing I also have, which I would recommend to everyone, particularly if anybody's going through separation or divorce, is, I can't see it on my screen, it's an enormous jar. It's about two foot high, it's like a euro or a picture, and it's full of compassion. And if it's a different, really difficult situation in mediation, I pick up my jar and I pour compassion all over you, so I have a real sense of, yeah, I'm okay, I can carry on, I can be here for you. And it's really, it, it can really ever do for people to be there as much as possible. So, compassion. Compassion, it's that point about kindness that was picked up earlier, isn't it? Patience. Yes, patience and, what was it, what did we have? Patience and kindness, I think. Yeah, patience, kindness and respect. That was it, respect. Patience, kindness and respect, that's a very good place to, to draw this to a conclusion. Um, we have one final practical question, which was how would a family find Sue's divorce journal? Which is very <laughs> It's on my website at the moment, and if you'd like to get it from there, you can buy it and we can send it out to you. Thank you. And um, as follow up to this webinar, the attendees will be sent um, an email, a follow up email, which will have all the details of our panellists 
um, it'll have the recording of the webinar and it'll have sort of website links and things so people can sort of follow up if they want to think about the other IMA or any of the other things that our excellent panelists have uh, mentioned. So uh, with just a couple of minutes to go, I think we'll draw this to a close. Thank you very much for attending this webinar. I hope you found it interesting and found it giving you some food for thought at this time of transition. Uh, if you want more information, uh, then do follow up with us, with me, or with any of the panel members, and you'll be sent the follow-up email, as I said. I just want to say thank you very much to Sue, to Louisa, to Jane, and to Alison for their time and consideration, uh, thinking about these, these important areas and having this discussion. And I also want to say thank you very much to Nisha, to Nisha Kumar, who is my our colleague, Alison touched on earlier, who so expertly organised the webinar and the associated technology. So thank you very much, Nisha. I know everybody can't see you, but we're very grateful. Thank so thank you very much, everybody. Have a good day and good luck with um, the rest of your week. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.